Good afternoon, SD57. It is uh, my pleasure to spend a little bit of time with you this afternoon and welcome you back to the 24-25 school year. Um, I really do hope that you had a restful summer, that you were able to have some time away to connect with friends or family um, and really take some time for yourself. Um, one of the things I truly want to advise each of you around, um, especially on this first day, is you have to kind of pace yourself when you get back. Um, you probably will go home exhausted today because it's been a while since you've had to engage your brain and kind of be physically um, on and active for this period of time. So uh, don't be hard on yourself. If by 8.30 you feel like it's time to go to bed, then go to bed at 8.30 because that does happen to me sometimes. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging and, and showing our respect for the beautiful ancestral lands, cultures and people of the Clayton Tanay, the McLeod Lake Indian Band and the Simp First Nation through whom we do many of the work with uh, our communities. Um, and it really is an honor and a privilege um, to be here. Um, I am actually very pleased that we were not impacted to any huge degree by um, forest fires or smoke this summer as we have been in previous years. I know some of our outlying communities um, did certainly see some impact for smoke. And I know that Belmont had a bit of a scare this summer, um, but I'm hopeful again that nobody was greatly impacted by any of those kinds of things. We are in um, for an interesting school year. They're all interesting, but um, I think, you know, we are living in a time of change and we certainly as educators are really kind of leading the forefront of some of that change. And um, I think our example and our ability to navigate that is going to be really um, imperative to the success of our students and families and making sure that we can respond to the ever changing needs of our society. Um, you know, nothing stays static um, in our communities and certainly in our schools, we're going to be seeing the same thing. Um, one of the most discussed pieces, of course, is the cell phone restrictions that have been put into place by government for this year. Um, I suspect many of you are aware that even though we in British Columbia had those restrictions announced in January, every province in Western Canada by the time June rolled around had those same restrictions and structures in place. So it literally is the entirety of Western Canada. Um, Ontario um, engaged in this last year. And so we will be all monitoring and working together to try to figure out and you know determine the best ways to manage all of these things. But the driver of this really is around student engagement, around increased mental health, uh, positive mental health, and around increased feelings of safety and inclusion for our students. So as much as I know um, for some people it might feel heavy handed at times, um, there is a reason and a driver for this. And again, we will kind of monitor our way and see how we get um, and where we get to. Um, I have a very brief PowerPoint I just want to share with you. It kind of highlights some of the items that um, I shared with some of our principal vice principals and senior staff um, earlier this summer when we got together. Um, and, you know, it kind of mirrors some of the things that we heard at the BC School Superintendents um, Association meetings that we attended earlier in August with Ministry of Education staff and others. So I'm just going to switch over to the share here. I think we're on the right screen and hopefully you are seeing a very lovely child that I'm not related to, but just um, really to me is kind of the reason that we do our work is to make an impact and a difference um, to students like this. So welcome back to the school year. Um, again, I want to honor and respect the beautiful ancestral lands, cultures and people of the Clayton Tanay, McLeod Lake Indian Band and the Sim First Nation through the work we do with our communities. It is a vital and important piece of our work around truth and reconciliation. So the mandate of public education, um, I think you will hear all sorts of different philosophical thinking around what this actually is, but really it is to provide the intellectual, social and engagement skills necessary for young people to be positive and productive citizens, and probably more so today than ever. Um, you know, some of us who are long seasoned in education, um, we were the holders and the fountains of knowledge at the front of our classrooms, you know, decades ago. And when kids, students were looking for answers, they would come to us and either we had them or we would try to find them. Um, that is no longer really our role. We really are facilitators and we really are helping students to um, navigate the world that they live in and make really good um, and inform decisions around the situations and circumstances that come to them. So maybe just something to think about, what are you ensuring, doing to ensure that mandate is met every day? No matter what your role is within our system, um, we all have that responsibility to make sure that mandate of public education is being met on a daily basis with every interaction and with every communication that we have. Um, equity and efficiency. You are going to hear me refer to these words very often. Um, 
They are two of the tenants, I think, that are going to drive decision making, that are going to drive some of the lenses um, for financial and other structural decisions that we make. And even though I know people often will look at these words and yes, they want equity and yes, they want efficiency. Um, there are people in our system right now who really are benefiting from the fact that we don't have equity in our system and everybody wants equity unless an inequity that really um, benefits them is taken away. And so I really want you to ask yourself when we're striving for equity and something, you know, gets on your back, it bothers you. Is it bothering you because you have been benefiting from an inequity that really, you know, is not um, fair across our district? And now we have to make some changes to that. Um, efficiency, we are still operating um, as a system with a very paper-based and archaic lens for lack of a better description, and we have to find some efficiencies. Um, the amount of paper that we move around in the school district is quite shocking to me, to be honest with you. And I know that we cannot make these changes you know, immediately. Um, they're not gonna be things that we can do tomorrow, even if I would like that and others would like that to happen. We're gonna have to do it with some strategy, with some time and to make sure that people have the training and implementation to put these things in place. Um, and just know that nothing is sacred. We need to improve our results across the education landscape. Um, you know, everybody in our district works very hard to do their very best for students, but we are not performing in terms of our educational outcomes to the degree that we could be. And so we want to move from being a lower performing school district, you know, to taking the next step to be mid performing and ultimately a high performing district. And, you know, that again, that's not going to happen in the course of one school year. But over the course of time, I think it is something that we can't ignore and we have to continue to address. So there are some changes coming to SD57. Um, there have been some reviews completed and now the work about how to respond to them begins. Um, these include a review of our HR departments, our technology review, um, a purchasing department review that still is kind of ongoing and the hiring of school district leadership. So we are in a challenge job market when you go home and watch the news today um, or even if you saw it this morning um, we have deficiencies we do not have enough teachers we do not have enough support staff we do not have enough folks who are really interested in working in the education system again a huge change from 10 20 years ago um, when really jobs are quite hard to get um, and we have to make sure that we are figuring out ways to attract and recruit the best and brightest and then once we have them here how to retain them so the items for review in 24-25, um, centralizing our funding and budgeting processes, um, there'll be a lot of discussion around that and we will really do our best to try to make sure that we're communicating with everybody effectively. Um, there still is the potential closure of sides that is being considered, um, a common rural timetable and video conferencing opportunities for our rural school students and schools, our long range facility planning, um, which again, a report will be coming out at the next board meeting with some of the highlights of that and the relocation of our Indigenous Ed Department to a more centralized place with a little bit more collaboration amongst all of our other district departments. So we have to find the right pace as much as we want some things to change now, that may not be possible. There are some structural and practical considerations. There are some system readiness to think about both in structure and in terms of you know, each of us as individuals, how much change are we ready for? And I know that for some folks, um, it can be very, very challenging to embrace um, change. But again, I would remind you that we are working in an ever-changing world, and so nothing is going to stay the same. And then, of course, district culture and practice, um, which I still am learning. I'm still you know, trying to understand the nuances of, because even though we have 60 school districts across BC that have a similar mandate, they all have edges and flow and ways of operation that are a little bit different from one place to the next. And SD57 certainly has its own culture and I'm trying to um, understand what it is, how it came to be, and then of course determine whether that's still meeting the needs effectively um, for our clients. So just some facts and figures from last school year. Um, there are 1,579 public schools in BC, 359 independent and 35 offshore schools. Um, 605,000 students across the province, of which we have about 13,000 or so. Um, and you can see some other information there around childcare, around Indigenous learners, around completion rates, um, around in our workforce. You know, one of the real positives is British Columbia is still considered to be one of the highest performing school systems in the entire world. Um, if you were going to do a ranking either through PISA or some of the other measurements that are in place, um, British Columbia would definitely be in the top 10, and we still are engaging and hosting um, other nations. 
to um, really learn some of the nuances and some of the things that they're doing. Um, for the longest time, those of you involved in education know that Finland was kind of held up as the beacon of, um, you know, education and, um, you know, really practices that we could take a look at. Um, Finland is no longer the considered the top performing school system in the world. It's actually Estonia. And I actually had to go to a map and figure out where Estonia was when I met some people from Estonia a few years ago. But they have a government that is highly, highly invested in education. They have students who learn multiple languages and really do embrace the thinking and structures from all of the countries that surround it. Um, but they've placed a high, high value on education and that clearly shows in their results. So communication improvements, uh, one of the things I've heard very clearly from across the district, almost in every conversation I've had, is the need for um, communication improvements. So we're going to start again with a reasonable pace. We're going to put a quarterly school district newsletter out, which will be um, published here at central office, but hopefully will be filled with stories from your schools, your classrooms, and from your students, um, just around the positives and some of the good things that are happening across the school district, which of which there are so many. Um, we want to revamp our website so that we have the ability to update and adjust it on the fly. Um, it currently doesn't really reflect, I'm going to say, the dynamic um, aspect of our school district, and we think that it really does need to look better. It also needs to be a little bit more functional in terms of its search operations and its ability to find and access information, so that's something that we're going to be looking at. Um, we are going to be engaging full system incorporation of school messenger this year. So what does that mean? If there's something that occurs at your school, uh, we can send a text to every parent and family you know, immediately. Um, so that doesn't have to go through the phone channels of your system. If there's information that we want to have out to families, um, then again, around transportation or you know, and wild animals on the land or any other kinds of information, we can get that out much more quickly. Um, the key with School Messenger, and I've used it in other school systems, is we can't um, be sending messages out constantly because people will ignore those messages if, you know, if they're kind of getting it on a you know, semi-daily basis. So really it is for the more emergent or things that we want to highlight. Um, we want a little bit more linearity between our school websites and our school district websites. So we will basically revamp the school website so that there's a section that gets updated centrally with up-to-date school district news, um, events, calendars, and things that might want to be highlighted for parents who are going to your school web page. And we will also work to inscribe to have board meeting highlights provided more promptly. Um, our goal is going to be to have them out within 48 to 72 hours post board meeting. Um, and some of you will notice that there is a change in structure to our trustee board meetings this year. Um, we're going to be meeting earlier in the month. So we'll be meeting on the second Tuesday of each month rather than the last Tuesday of each month. And in order to facilitate a public meeting, the public meeting will start at 6 p.m. rather than at 4 p.m. so that members of the public can attend should they choose to. And so, you know, again, some small steps in communication improvements. We'll see what we can actually manage, but we actually hope that they will make a difference in terms of the information that's getting out there. So your perspectives matter. You know, your voice is an important one at any school district discussion table. Um, most of you belong to um, union groups that have um, representation and uh, basically have a voice at those tables. But if you have perspectives that you want to share, uh, make sure that you do that through those representatives that sit at those tables. Be positive and optimistic about your school, your role in school district 57 schools. Um, the messaging out of school district 57 has not been as positive as it should be over the last number of years, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. But we need some unity of purpose and we need some more positive messaging. And I think it's really important that we together start to share our stories about the good things that are happening in our district, because there are many, many good things happening in our district. And that really is an attribute to each of you um, and the connections that you make to students and families across um, our system is definitely all the better for you. So what will the School District 57 storyline be this year? We have to tell our own stories, not wait for the stories to be told about us or for us. Uh, we need to engage our student voices to a higher level than we already have. You know, it's great that we have DSAC and we have opportunities for students to come forward, but I know that, you know, our community wants to hear from our students rather than from those of us adults who um, work to, um, you know, organize and help support students. So that's a really important piece. Uh, we need to have our rights holders, our partner groups, and our community beside us in the journey. So again, through communication, we need to share with people what it is that we're doing, um, the timelines that we hope to achieve, um, and really what the outcomes of some of those changes in structure really are going to be. So I would ask you, how are we going to begin to accomplish that? You know, collectively, I believe that we can uh, manage many, many positive things for our students and for our community, 
Um, and again, I look forward to hearing from you and your voice and your perspective around how some of those things can occur. So I just want to thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to the year ahead with all of you. I am planning to be in schools quite predominantly um, as you know, this first week gets by. I'm going to give everybody a little bit of time this week just to get their feet under them. But you should expect to see me in your school during the course of the school year. Um, if I come to your classroom, if I come to your space, you don't need to stop what you're doing. Um, to, I just am coming to observe and to engage. And I'm happy to have a conversation, of course, but don't feel compelled that you need to stop what you're doing in order to um, you know, acknowledge my presence because I want to be present more often. So again, I thank all of you. I really do wish you my very best for a positive school year ahead. Make sure when you get home today that you eat well, go to bed early, make sure you're ready for the next school day. And all we can do is take it one day at a time together. So thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to connecting. My very best.